It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 142, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Today, we're digging back into the archives for one of my favorite interviews, our very first episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast with my good friend, Liz Grazenack. This one was recorded in early October of 2014, just for a bit of reference when we're talking about weather events. In 2014, Liz was farming a little over seven acres of ground in central Missouri and selling her certified organic produce through a CSA, farmer's market, and to restaurants and grocery stores. In her fifth year of running her farm, Liz reflected on the challenges and rewards of running a business, managing employees, and doing all of the other stuff that isn't farming, but is absolutely integral to it. We also dig into some post-harvest handling, talk about winter production, and discuss how her two-year-old has changed life on her farm. Liz also shares her experience becoming part of her very conventional rural neighborhood. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com And by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web makes it easier to work with your buyers, saving time, reducing errors, and increasing your capacity to work with more buyers overall. Farmersweb.com. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. All right. Welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast, everybody. I'm simply thrilled to introduce as our guest today, Liz Grazenack. Liz, I've given our listeners just a little bit of an overview, but I'd like to hear more from you to start about your farm and its history. Can you tell us more about what kind of scale you're operating on, how you grow your crops, where and how you market and how you got into farming? Yes. Um, Okay, well, we'll start with uh, the size of the farm. Um, Our farm is 82 acres. We're located in northern Montauk County, about 45 minutes outside of Columbia, Missouri. Um, I'm definitely in the heart of farming country here in Missouri. Um, I am farming um, and actually have in cultivation a little over seven acres. Um, The farm is certified organic. Um, I operate a CSA and I sell um, to a couple local restaurants um, at a farmer's market that's a year-round farmer's market in Columbia. And this year I added um, a couple of wholesale accounts at two different uh, grocery stores in Columbia. Um, This is my fifth year farming full-time. My partner, wife actually, and I bought our farm in November of 2007, and I started farming full-time in the spring of 2010. Um, And before coming to farming, um, I was in graduate school at Cornell, and uh, luckily uh, met Liz Henderson, and she sort of changed my trajectory from wanting to pursue a PhD and um, I decided I wanted to be a farmer instead. (laughs) Uh, I joined a CSA um, just sort of in my normal daily life as a grad student and um, just totally fell in love with it Um, and uh, went to a presentation that Liz was giving on campus just by chance. Um, and she encouraged me to go to um, a conference that was in the Northeast um, that I went to that winter. And um, and sort of through the next few months, I figured out that uh, I probably shouldn't just go out and try and buy a farm and start farming, that I needed to um, try and learn something about farming first. Um, so I finished with my master's degree and went um, to a farm um, with my partner at that time um, outside of Washington, D.C. and interned there for a year and um, ended up back, deciding to come back to Columbia, which is where I'm from, because I wanted to be closer to my family. And I worked on another farm for a, um, another full growing season. And that market or that farm, we just sold at a farmer's market and we didn't have a CSA. Um, but I was the one main person on that farm, um, for this, for the year. And when I was that, that farm is when I realized that I really wanted to do this for a career. And, um, I would like to own my own farm. I wasn't, um, that interested in continuing to work on other people's farms. Um, but I didn't have any money. And 
So like we hear a lot about these days, land access, um, I, I realized that if I was going to be able to buy a farm, I needed to um, do something that was making more money than um, the farming jobs that I had had those last two years. Um, so I got a job at a local garden center. And I worked at that garden center um, and eventually became the general manager. And I was there for um, just under six years. Um, and while I was working there, the whole goal of working there was uh, saving money so that I could um, afford to buy a farm. And in the meantime, not really realizing it, but I learned a hell of a lot about running a business and managing employees and um, advertising and marketing. Um, and all the things that don't have anything to do with farming on the day-to-day -day basis, um, but have to do with running a business. Um, I learned that. Um, so I, I, we bought the farm in November of 07 while I was still working um, at the garden center. And like I said, the winter of 2009 is when I left the garden center and then started farming um, full-time in the spring of 2010. So that's a very brief um, history of how I came to where I am. A brief history of a long path. I mean, that uh, sounds like about eight or nine years between the time that you decided that you were going, that you were going to start farming to the time when you actually did uh, put your first shovel in the dirt on your own farm. That's right. Wow. Yep. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a long I, time to maintain that kind of focus, Liz. I oh. <laughs> was very committed to making the fact that I really wanted to farm happen. Um, and so, yeah. Now, do you, do you farm with your wife? No, I do not. Um, Katie is very happy and very glad to say on a regular basis um, that she loves being a farmer's wife, but not being the farmer. <laughs> um, so Katie, Katie does work off the farm. And um, at this point, this year, year five, um, I will, I will end the year uh, in the black. I will not be in debt. <laughs> I will have covered the farm's expenses um, and paid myself a very small amount. But most importantly, I will have covered the farm's expenses um, fully from the money that I've raised farming. Up until now, I would not have been able to do it without Katie's income. Wow. That's a, I mean, that's a, five years. I mean, for, for a farm that's as, as large and, and, and ambitious as yours, that's a, that's a long time to kind of be operating, um, kind of under the gun, I guess. Well, um, you know, when you, when you buy a farm and it's, it's new, um, to you as a farmer, um, and the farm that I bought, I really, I looked for, um, over two years, uh, for the farm that we bought and it is, um, I could not wish for anything more out of a piece of ground um, than what we have, except for maybe a little bit more tillable acreage. Um, but really our farm has everything on it that I had on my wish list of what I wanted in a farm. Um, but it didn't have any outbuildings. It has very small house. So everything that currently is on my farm, I have had to build. Um, so there's been a lot of money required um, in the last five years um, to get the infrastructure built in order to be able to run an, uh, a farm. Well, and of um, course, not just capital expense, but that expense of of you having to you having to kind of manage that as an ongoing project too. You know, which takes you away from all those hours that you could be spending cultivating carrots. Yeah. Oh, which is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> you don't like, wait, I see now, now somebody who has the kind of focus to spend eight years getting ready to start farming. I would think that you would have the kind of focus that would make, that would make cultivating carrots your favorite activity. Oh God. Oh no. Mm -mm, I can't get over carrots. Carrots and I do not get along, Chris. <laughs> I'm really sorry to hear that, Liz. Um, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I, I bought an Alice Chalmers G uh, two years ago and I, I built the cultivating implement um, that I, I, had, I could not find one anywhere. Um, so I ended up building a cultivating implement and I finally got it tweaked this year and it really is working great on, um, it, it's working great. But this winter I'm, I wanna build a Laylee Tyne um, weeder. So 
I think maybe I hope that will help me with my fear of carrots. <laughs> <laughs> so on your seven acres, so you've got the, you've got the Alice Chalmers G that you're using for cultivating. Do you, I assume you've got another tractor that you're using for your tillage, right? Right. I actually have three other tractors. Um, the very first tractor that I ever bought was a Ford 801. And I use that for pretty much carrying, hauling, um, moving stuff on the farm. Anything that I am moving around, that's what I use that tractor for. And I bought a, um, a larger Ford um, 5600 um, in my second year. And I use that tractor for pretty much most of the um, cultivating, not cultivating, but most of the like tillage that you, um, disking and um, any major earth stuff that I'm doing. I use that bigger tractor for. And then last year I actually had a CSA member give me a Massey Ferguson tractor um, that I haven't really figured out a good way to work into the mix yet. Um, but I have it and I may use it. I may end up selling it. Um, I don't know. So I, and the the bigger blue Ford has served me very, very well um, until I got as big as I am. And and now it, it I don't have a loader, um, which is one thing that, you know, I've known for you know five years that I really needed to have, but I just didn't have one. Um, so I'm actually getting ready to um, I've already found a tractor. And so I'm getting ready to sell that um, bigger Ford and get a tractor that's going to suit my needs better. So you've got, I mean, with, with four tractors on the operation, are you, are you a fairly, and you, and you talked about building your own cultivators. Are you a fairly handy person? I would say yes. Um, I detest paying somebody to do something that I can either muscle my way through or figure out how to do it. Um, so yes, I, it's just maybe just part of my um, my temperament or my, my personality. Um, but I'm, it, I figure out a way to, to do things um, because, I mean, you have to, I think, in order to be a farmer. And I, like I said, I really do not like the idea of having to hire somebody to do something that I feel like I'm quite capable of doing. I just have to learn the skills in order to be able to do it. So where, where have you gone to learn those skills? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to find books about, about horticulture you know, you can read it, you read up on Elliot Coleman and you can read up on your Liz Henderson and get some ideas about how all that stuff works, but there's not a lot out there for how to get your hands dirty and fix a tractor. Right. Um, so I have learned everything that I know about how to fix a tractor, how to build a cultivator, um, everything about, um, so the right time to work soil when it's too wet, when it's too dry, um, when it's still, still too cool in the spring, yet the ground is workable. Um, I've learned about electricity, about plumbing, um, about construction. I've learned everything from my neighbors that are all farmers, um, in my immediate sort of circle of community. Um, okay, so I've learned, how, how, I've I mean, learned how, how does that work that I though, Liz? I mean, you're, you're, I mean, here you are, you're, you're a lesbian organic vegetable farmer moving out to, um, <laughs> moving out to the far, yeah. rural, rural Southern Missouri. This is not, doesn't actually yeah. seem like the kind of environment where, where people would be, uh, entirely welcoming of, of, uh, um, I know, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, so, um, I wrote a story just um, that, that talks a little bit about this. I wrote a story in, um, I'm going to blank on the name of the book. Um, it was, it was published by the um, Greenhorns a few years ago. Um, I'm looking at my bookshelf. It's, I think it's just called the Greenhorns. Um, and it's just a short story. It was a collection of short stories by farmers, new, mostly new beginning farmers. Yeah, it's called Greenhorns, um, The Next Generation of American Farmers, 50 Dispatches from the New Farmers Movement. Have you heard of that, Chris? I haven't, uh, but I think we're going to look it up, and I know we'll get a link yeah, to that I'll on the show up. notes. So These, the stories in this book are... In, they're incredible. I could not put the book down. I literally read it in one night. Um, I laughed. I cried out loud. Um, I, I could connect with every single story that was written in this book. Um, 
and you're right. I, I, I think that there has been a lot of luck um, in the fact that I landed where I have landed. Um, you, I mean, I'm totally in the middle of the Bible Belt. Um, the the one farmer in particular um, that befriended me um, when we moved out here. I mean, people are curious. All the neighbors wanted to know who we were, who this couple was, these two women that had bought this farm, you know, in their community. And um, it was strange that we were driving back and we weren't around a lot because we drove to Columbia. Columbia is 45 minutes away. So we weren't here a whole lot. Um, and I can distinctly remember in the first year, um, you know, I'd never lived in the country before. Um, and in the first year, I got a, a flat tire on my truck uh, while I was going into town. We have probably two and a half miles of gravel. And I'm our farm is at the very dead end of the gravel road. You cannot go any farther past my place. Um, so I got a flat tire. And I was running late to work. Um, and so I had my mom come and get me. So I left my truck on the side of the road. When I came back from work at the end of the day, you know, it was dark the tire had been changed on my truck, um, which I was, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, and it was my neighbor, JT Castle, who is um, now 74 years old. And he had, he happened to like be driving down the road and he and his cousin Philip had seen that the tire was flat on my truck. And so they, and I, we live in the country. Like I don't lock a door on anything. Um, and so they had taken the key. They got the tire out from under my truck, the spare, and they put the spare on my, on my truck and they put the flat tire in the bed of my truck. Wow. Um, and he left a little note in his chicken scratches cause his handwriting is very bad and he can't spell worth a lick. Um, and he left me this little note that said, you know, I changed your tire. Um, I don't know, something else. And I was so, I was so floored. Like I literally, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe the um, gift that had happened. And so Katie and I, I didn't even do it. Katie made um, a cherry pie and we took it over to their house one evening to say thanks. And, you know, it turns out that it was the most ridiculous thing ever because we were taking this cherry pie to the world's worst world's best baker. That was a little Freudian slip right there. <laughs> best baker and pie maker that has ever existed. JT's wife, Mary. Um, and the pie crust wasn't all that good on Katie's pie. And, and we, we sat there, we ate it and they ate it and they said how delicious it was. But then Mary told us the key to making good pie crust was lard. And so she gave us some lard and literally from that moment on, like JT and Mary have adopted us and we have grown closer and closer, um, in the last, you know, however many years it is now since, um, since we've been here and JT and his family have lived in this community since the 1800s, like his family, the castle family. Wow. So everybody knows JT. And I just somehow got, I think I got very lucky, but we also reached out to them and sure, two years into our being here, um, Katie and I, so I had known JT and I had known Mary and they would, JT would come by periodically, check on me, wanted to see what I was doing. I mean, he thought it was crazy that a woman was out here farming and, and he said to me, he said to me once, but I also heard from another neighbor that he said to this neighbor that any woman that works as hard as I work, it doesn't matter that I'm a lesbian. Anybody that works as hard as I work is okay in his book. <laughs> this is what this other neighbor told me. Those are real world and, um, values right there. You know, it's, it's not, it's not who right, you are. It's I how mean, hard you work. That really makes the difference. How hard you work. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. And, um, so periodically, you know, JT would come by, um, K Katie and I had our commitment ceremony, um, on the farm in the fall of 2010. And by that point, you know, I knew Mary, I knew JT pretty well. I knew his kids. I knew his family. Um, and so I invited them. I felt like it would be rude of me to not invite them. 
and um, we got married on Halloween, actually. <laughs> um, so <laughs> funny enough. Um, but I, the week before, um, after I had sent out invitations, the week before, I was out planting garlic, and it was pretty. It was like near dusk, um, but I was planting garlic and JT drove out into the field and got out of his truck and came over and said, you know, Liz, hey, I need to talk to you. And I was like, OK, so I come, you know, walking up out of the field and he he stood there and he proceeded to tell me that he was afraid that he would hurt our friendship, but that he just couldn't come to our wedding because he didn't believe in it. He didn't think that it was right. He, he told me, you know, why he had those beliefs. He and his wife are um, Pentecostal. Um, and I don't really know very much about religion at all. Um, but I know they're very conservative religiously, JT and Mary are. And, and he stood there and he cried in my field. Um, telling me how worried he was that if they didn't come, that it would hurt our friendship. And um, he was concerned that that would happen, but he wanted me to understand why they couldn't come and et cetera. And, I, and so of course he was crying. So then I started crying. Um, and I told him that it was fine. It didn't matter. It wasn't going to hurt my friendship with him. And I certainly understood. And he was, it was, it was, it was totally fine. He, it was, I was, I respected his beliefs and I didn't want him to be uncomfortable. And I told him, Hey, you know, we're going to have a big party afterwards. And if you guys want to come to our party, we're going to have bluegrass music and great food and, you know, just come for the party. And, and he and his wife did come to the party and their daughter and her husband, they came to the wedding. Um, but JT and Mary came to the party and they had such a good time. JT actually went home and got his banjo and came back and played with the band um, because he plays banjo and they had a wonderful time and we did too. And I think like really since, since that moment since since our wedding um in october of 2010 my relationship with jt and mary has just gotten stronger and stronger and um i i truly like they are my adopted grandparents um and jt comes over nearly every day to see what i'm doing to see if i need help with something um I, I just, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky. Um, and I think it's just because I reached out from that very initial, um, you know, when we took the pie over to say, thanks, that was so generous, generous of you to change the tire on my truck. <laughs> um, and it's just, I, I feel very lucky that we have landed where we are and I have learned so much about farming and about how to fix things and, like I said, you know, I put in a new well and I've replumbed my well house and I built a barn. Um, and I mean, I had help, you know, but I have done these things. I've learned how to do these things, run electricity um, and do these things that you have to know how to do if you're going to be a farmer. But you got to learn from somebody. Um, and I've learned a lot from JT. That's really great. I just, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> It's so important, I think, to have those kinds of relationships on the farm. And and I recently did an interview with uh, with Paul Arnold from Pleasant Valley Farm up in upstate yeah. New York, and he talked about the importance that his dad had had on on his farm of of this this somebody who was able to who knew how to do that kind of stuff, but also was able to pay some attention to those things that weren't just urgent. They were important. You know, having that kind of support network, I think, is is really critical for farming, and it's it's easy especially when you're doing something weird like vegetable farming and then a little bit weirder like organic vegetable farming in yeah. the middle of a sea of corn and soybeans it's easy to forget how important those resources are um if you if you didn't bring them with you you know that you need those yeah. other people around you who you can turn to to help you get things done to answer those questions about living in the country and um cuz you're i mean that's that's just a skill in and of itself. Just being, being 45 minutes from the city is, is something that, uh, it sounds like you, it sounds like you were up in the city, right? I was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. So and I grew up in town, you know, the, the idea of not being able just to turn around and go to the store. I think, I think a lot of beginning farmers, uh, underestimate the, the skills that it takes to live in the country, uh, just on you a day to day be, basis. 
you have to be so organized. You have to be so organized. And I don't, I don't, I don't have a shirt pocket like you do, but I have a butt pocket that my notebook lives in. And I am writing stuff in that notebook. I couldn't tell you how many times a day. Um, you have to be so organized. Um, otherwise, half your day is going to be spent running errands to get something that you forgot to get when you were in town last. Um, and nobody has time to be off the farm that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You gotta be you know, on the, you gotta be on the farm to do the farming. That's for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, let's, let's just geek out on the, on the organizational technology for a minute. You're a, so you, you're a, you're a notebook person. You're not a, you're not taking notes on your iPhone or anything. No, um, I, I got my first iPhone this, this January. Um, and it was upon the pushing, extreme pushing of a um, good friend of mine that also um, lives out here. Um, he was exacerbated by the fact that he couldn't text me <laughs> because our farm is in a valley and, um, I did not, I had a good cell phone. I had a, um, you know, a, I don't know what you call it, smartphone. Um, but my service provider did not have good service in this valley. And so I had to switch to AT&T and I got an iPhone and um, I, I use it so much more now than I thought that I would now that I have it. Um, but I can, I can get a text. I can get a cell phone call, um, you know, when I'm on the farm, whereas before I couldn't, um, I still rely mostly on email, which I can do when I'm in the house at night. Um, but yeah, I still keep a notebook and that's where I do all of my note taking and go back and look through my notes in the winter. Um, things that I've written down to myself that I didn't want to forget. Any, any particular, any particular notebook that you're a, that you're a high fan of, or are you, uh, you know, out there with your mole schemes or do you just pick up the, the three by five, uh, paper notebooks that you can get five for a dollar at Staples? No, I use the, um, the ones that are waterproof. Um, they have a yellow, um, a yellow cover. I can't think what they're called. Um, right in the rain. Yeah. Right in the rain. That's what I use. It's a small size. It's a good size for me and it it's waterproof. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and so you're, I mean, it, the, the iPhone, I mean, it's, it, it is interesting to me. In fact, I saw a lot of farmers when they were, when the smartphones first came out, I saw a lot of farmers being early adopters with those. And I was surprised at some of the people that I on the list serves, or you'd see a comment from somebody in growing for market magazine about, um, about something that they were doing with their iPhone and how, how quickly folks pick that up. What are you, what do you use yours for when you're on the farm? Um, I get texts. Um, there's one restaurant that she prefers to text me her order. So, um, I use it for that. Mostly, really on the farm, the majority of what I use it for is for taking pictures. Um, it's my, instead of, you know, drawing out on a piece of paper, my crop plans and where things are planted, I use my phone to take pictures, um, to take records of where things are and how they're growing. And, um, but I guess I mostly use it for the camera. I just, I mean, I do, I love that. And, and having that ability to, to get that time and date stamp right on there. You know, you don't have right. to, you don't have to ask yourself, if, was that a picture from the broccoli crop in the middle of July or in the <laughs> middle of, in the middle of August? That was, you, you got it all right there. And I know we use that, uh, all over the farm for, uh, for record keeping everything from, from logging, uh, the, the information about our seed envelopes all the way to keeping track of those planting records and, and records of how things were doing in the field. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's mostly what I use it for. All right, we're going to take a break here, get a word from a couple of our sponsors here in 2017 and be back with Liz Graznack in just a moment. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and across the homestead. 
on my own farm. We went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we got finally got smart, bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. Support's also provided by Farmer's Web, software for your farm. Farmer's Web helps you manage orders from buyers who place them online and also those that order by phone or email. Use Farmer's Web to generate a product catalog for buyers, allow buyers to view your real-time availability online, and create harvest lists and packing slips for your orders. Farmer's Web helps you inform your buyers of delivery routes, pickup locations, lead times, and more, all while helping you keep track of special pricing and customer information. You can also download detailed financial reports. Farmer's Web offers a free account type and a flat monthly fee on paid plans. You can pause, cancel, or switch plan types at any time. Check out a demo video and the Farmer's Web guide to working with wholesale buyers at farmersweb.com. Perennial support for the podcast is also provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living potting soils for organic growers since 1992. You know, most of us didn't get into this business to make the most money in the fastest possible time frame, and neither did Vermont Compost Company. And you know, the funny thing is, this organic farming thing doesn't really work that way anyways. Organic farming works best when you use the discipline of business to guide your investments in the future. And that's what Vermont compost potting soils do without glitz and without clamor, but with the art and the science that creates an ideal living matrix where your transplants can really thrive, setting the stage for success throughout the year. And while it's not all about the money, Vermont compost fall pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price with the best shipping options. Don't miss out. Vermont compost fall pre-buy program runs through December 21st, taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. And we're back with Liz Grazenack of Happy Hollow Farm in Missouri. So to take a to take a different tack then, um, you grew up in Columbia, right? I did. Okay. And you're marketing now in Columbia, 45 minutes away yes. from the farm. Um, mm-hmm. how's that been to come back? Um, it's been a lot easier than I thought it would. Uh I would say I have um an advantage over uh, many people that are wanting to start farming. I grew up in an entrepreneurial, is that the right word? Entrepreneurial yeah. um, family. Um, my grandfather owned businesses. My mom is a business owner. Um, I grew up in the retail world of business owners. And even though, you know, nobody ever sat me down and said, this is how you run a business. <laughs> um, you know, I paid attention because that was the world that I grew up in. Um, I learned through osmosis and, and just, you know, sort of by doing it and paying attention, how to create a good display and how to market, um, visually my produce. Um, so selling at the farmer's market is, um, I really enjoy it because I love uh, talking to people. I love meeting my customers and I love putting together a beautiful display. Um, it, you know, my very first year that I started, um, with the CSA, which is what I did, Initially, I had a CSA of 19 customers. Um, my next year, the second year, I had 56 customers. Um, and it was all, all it was was word of mouth because I was only doing a CSA my first year. Um, my second year, I did the 56 customer CSA. Um, my third year, I was at a, right about 60, maybe somewhere in there, CSA members. And I started selling at a smaller farmer's market in Columbia. It was a Sunday market. Um, and I wanted to sell at that market to just make sure that I had enough product, not only for my CSA members, but enough that I could take to market to put together a, a good display um, before I committed to going to the really big farmer's market that's on Saturday, um, um, which I started doing last year. So I don't do the Sunday market anymore. I go to the large 80 plus vendor farmer's market on Saturdays. Um, and I still have, um, and, and, that, and last year I had around 60 CSA members. Um, and this year I have 65 members and I'm selling at that farmer's market in addition to um, the wholesale accounts that I added this year. Now for, for your CSA, that's you, you're packing up those shares for people and delivering them to town as a, in boxes or bags, right? 
yes, in boxes, actually, um, cedar boxes that I made from cedar that I, cedar trees that I cut down off the farm and, and had milled at a sawmill. And then I used a friend's woodworking shop to build the boxes. Of course you did. <laughs> I will, I mean, I'll tell you my CSA members, the new members, when they get their first box, every single one of them emails me and says, my God, Liz, it is so beautiful. Um, just the, just the presentation of the produce in the box um, is dramatic. And that's what I want. Um, and, and then, and then, you know, after that, wears off, then I start to hear, wow, your, your vegetables are fabulous. Um, but I want that presentation. That, that um, wow factor that uh, you talked about that for that, with that retail, you know, when you come in the door of a retail shop, you want to, you want to go, Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> this is, right. this is where I want to be. And I, that's, that's a really interesting, I've never heard of anybody that, that places that much of an emphasis on the container that the product is delivered in. Yeah. Um, it, it unfortunately, um, has resulted in, you know, I don't always get my boxes back at the end of the year. Yeah. I would think that'd (laughs) be a big issue. Yeah. I mean, the majority of people are more than happy to, um, they, they get the boxes back to me, but it's, it is a very nice box. Um, and I have just decided and, and I'm okay with the fact that every winter I have to build some more boxes. Um, to just make sure that I have enough. Um, but so a member, you know, each week they receive their box, they take their box with them and next week they bring their box back and they get a new box. Um, and I have a few people that take their, take their veggies out of their, their box and they put it in, in their own bag. Um, but there's not a, not most people don't do that. Most people take the box with them. Right. So you've got, uh, two boxes for every member. I have about three boxes for every member Okay, Okay. because, you know, people forget to bring their box back. (laughs) And how are you making decisions about how much stuff goes into the CSA shares? I mean, 60, 60 CSA shares is, is that's a pretty significant number on a farm your size. That's also doing a farmer's market. That's also doing wholesale. Um, How are you, how are you splitting those, splitting that product out? Um, I pay very close attention to the retail value of the product that goes into the box. Um, you know, I, I base it on what I sell produce for at the farmer's market. Um, in the spring, um, I usually, because it's a lot, it's, you know, usually pretty heavy on greens. Um, so the retail value might not add up exactly to, um, the re- the dollar per week that the share actually cost. Um, and there might be a few weeks that are like that, but when you move more into summer with tomatoes and squash and cucumbers and stuff like that, um, I usually make up for that by giving them a little bit more than their retail value of what the CSA share cost. Um, and I pay very close attention to, um, you know, do I have enough for all of the shares? Do I not have enough? Can I just give something to a full and partial share and maybe not the single shares this week? And then next week the singles might get it and the partials may not get it. Um, but I, I, I would say primarily, you know, I, I want to make sure that I give, if I have it on the farm, I give it to my CSA members. Um, but I do in my head tally every week, like how much the retail value is of what they're getting in their boxes. Okay. And, and Columbia, I mean, you said an 80 vendor farmer's market, Columbia must be a pretty sizable market then. It is. It is. Um, there are only two of us that are certified organic. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Um, I did have last year, there were two other farms. So there were four of us, a whopping four. Um, but those two farms, um, are, are not, not really selling anymore. Um, I don't think that they've disappeared, but they certainly aren't at the market this year. Um, you know, that's one advantage that I have. I think I am, I am one of the bigger vendors that sells at our market, which helps, um, when you have a really big display, um, two tents and four tables and you know, that makes a difference. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a big market. Um, I wouldn't say that 
It seems that there are not as many people, um, and I get this from my survey um, results, you know, when I send out surveys that most of my members are not that concerned with the certified organic aspect as they are the supporting a local farmer aspect. Um, but I try really hard um, in my newsletter to talk about, you know, why I'm certified organic and talk about, you know, my my belief and opinion about why it's it's um, important to be certified organic. And I talk a lot about my farming techniques and, and the things that I do on the farm um, to, to try and educate my members. Um, and I, when I have a chance to have co those kinds of conversations with my members, which you know, honestly, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, but sometimes like after I'll, I send out something in maybe the newsletter that is talking about the cover crop seed that I just sowed because I'm going to be planting brassicas in this field next year and, you know, et cetera, I'll get at least maybe one. And even if I just get one member that sends me an email and it's like, wow, I had no idea that it was that involved and that you're already planning where your fall broccoli is going to go in September. <laughs> if I can just get it one person to change their mind and realize the importance of why supporting organic farmers is important. Well, that's one more person that I feel like, you know, hopefully will buy organic when they go to the grocery store. So why, why do you feel like certified organic as opposed to something like certified naturally grown or just, just going out there and, and mm -hmm. doing the sustainable label? Why, why are you, it, um, there's all extra expense, you know, every, everybody says, Oh, you know, it's so hard to do all the paperwork. I mean, what, what motivates you? Um, the paperwork and the, the record keeping that being organic requires makes me a better farmer flat out, like no questions asked. Um, I am much more organized and keep much better records than I am sure that I would, um, if I was not certified organic, because I, it would be easy to just not keep those records because I'm so busy. I think that it's very important because it holds me to the same standards that other organic farmers are held to. And yes, I totally think that my, you know, small scale certified organic farm is not anywhere close to, you know, one of the large certified organic lettuce farms in California, like they're apples and oranges, but at least we are following the same rules um, and held accountable to the same rules. Um, and I can say that I am following those rules um, and I'm doing everything in my power to grow, you know, super great, healthy, non pesticide laden food. Um, and you, you can't do that with any of the other options that are out there. Like you can say you're doing it, but there's no third party non biased source backing me up. And do you feel, has that been important for you with your, with your restaurant clients or with your grocery store clients? So the restaurants could care less. They, they do not care at all. The one thing that I do hear from the restaurants is that there's a big difference in the quality of my product compared to some of the other farms around, but that doesn't, the fact that I'm certified organic doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, it doesn't affect that. One of the biggest uh, wholesale account that I have with the grocery store, it does matter because Natural Grocers, which is a Colorado based company, um, they only carry certified organic produce and fruit. Um, so I wouldn't be able to sell product to them if I wasn't certified organic. Um, this is the first year that I've been selling to them um, and, it, and they have, they are a fabulous customer. I mean, absolutely wonderful and I have loved working with them. Um, but I was organic you know, five years ago, four years ago. So it, it doesn't, it, it didn't, it just made it very easy to walk into their store and say, Hey, would you all be interested in carrying my product? And they were like, yes, absolutely. So what have you, what have you liked about working with the grocery store? Well, you know, I, I only grow, um, a few things for them. I, I, planted, planned on and planted and am growing just a few items for them. Items that are um, easy for me, that are good money makers. Um, and they buy a lot of them. <laughs> um, it's been a, it's just been another good weekly outlet of selling product. Um, selling, you know, many more bunches of kale or Swiss chard than I would ever sell at the farmer's market in a week. 
and and their the the employees in their produce department and their general manager came out to the farm this spring and and worked with me for a morning. We actually planted a bed of kale, um, and I don't know they their their store just seems to be really excited to have me and have my product in the store. Um, it's been a good income source. And I didn't come down all that much. I mean, it came down some, but I didn't come down a crazy amount um, on my price um, because I, I couldn't afford to. Even comp- when you say didn't come down on your price compared to what you're selling it for at farmer's market. That's right. Wow. That's great. Really nice. Yeah, nice when I you can sell, make that work. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, one of the first things that happened a few weeks into um, after they were carrying my stuff this spring, they started cutting up samples and they were handing out samples of my dinosaur kale and the dinosaur kale that they were getting in from California. And I mean, there's a huge difference in the flavor (laughs) um, between our two kales and they don't carry the kale from California anymore um, because people were buying my kale because it's so much better. Um, That's great. I, I love yeah. I love hearing stories like that because so often we hear from grocery stores uh, and institutions that that they have a hard time getting product from local producers that is as high a quality as what they're used to getting out of California and Arizona. But, but you're, I mean, you mentioned earlier that your product is consistently rated as having a higher quality by your, by your buyers. And then, and then you add that flavor on it too, which, which isn't something you can use to sell the first bunch, but it is something that, that gets people coming back again and again. What are you doing? Do you think that makes your, that, that keeps your quality up there and makes your kale more flavorful than the stuff that's coming out of California. More flavor. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I have good soil. <laughs> um, I, I, I do take very good care of the soil. Um, I don't, I don't really know exactly what I'm doing that makes it taste so much better. I, I can't tell you. Um, I, I have very strict and my interns and employees this year, I'm sure they would tell you, um, they might think that it's over the top strict, (laughs) but I have very strict, um, rules about harvesting and bunching and immediate, um, cooling and walk-in temperatures and, um, you know, what time of day we harvest certain crops and which times of day we, you know, harvest other crops. So I, my post-harvest handling, I, I, you know, it could be better. I'm sure it could be better. Um, but I feel like it's pretty good because um, I I have very long shelf life, I guess, um, for my, my vegetables. Well, and I think that is uh, such a, that's such a critical defining factor for, for the wholesale buyer. If you want to be selling to a store, if you want to be selling into a, into a cafeteria or a, a food service environment, they've got to have product that lasts. And, and I've heard stories again and again, that this is where, this is one of the, the key barriers to, to getting beginning farmers and, and other farmers into getting local food into the big marketplaces where we can really be starting to talk about volume and having an ability to really change the food system rather than just changing where the farmer's market vendors come from. So can we, can we dig in and talk about, you know, what, let, let's talk about kale. I mean, um, what exactly are you doing? So you said you've got specific times, you've got specific procedures for getting stuff uh, wet, getting it cold. Could we walk through kale harvest at, at, uh, at Happy Hollow Farm? Um, sure. Um, so in the spring and right now, um, our start time on the farm is 7.30. Um, for two and a half months during the summer, it, our start time is 6.30. Um, and if we're harvesting kale, you know, on that morning, um, we do chores and by eight o'clock or seven o'clock respectively, um, we're in the field harvesting kale. Um, rubber bands are on our fingers for the number of bunches that we need. Crates are out in the field with us. Um, and we're harvesting and bunching and the plants get cleaned as I, as you go. So if you're harvesting off of this block of kale, um, you take off the leaves that aren't, that aren't a keeper for a bunch. Um, and you make your bunch as you go. And I usually put, it depends on the size of the leaves, but anywhere between 10 to 12 leaves in a bunch, um, the leaves get 
bunched, um, like if you consider the top, what the top of the leaf is, they get set on top of each other, like, um, like if you were making a bouquet, right. I guess. Right. Um, and then the rubber band goes around the stem about an inch up from the bottom three times around. Cause if you go four times around, um, it cuts the kale too much. Um, the rubber band, each of those three times around, they're all like they're bunched together. You don't, do you know what I mean by like, it's easy when I can show, show somebody like, I don't want one of the pieces of that three times around of the rubber band to be like off. Right. Um, They've got to all be next to each other. They have to all be next to each other. Right. Um, because I want it to look neat. I want it to look like it was intentionally done that way and you have to intentionally do it that way. Otherwise you will have one of the pieces, you know, not with the other two pieces, the kale gets put in a crate and they get alternated in the crate. So you can fit the most in the crate that you can like, um, alternated as in, but, but like stem end to head end, um, alternated in the crate and they get neatly stacked in there so that when that crate goes to the barn to be washed, it's easy to, to grab the kale out of the crate and put it in the water quickly and not like fumble around with trying to get the kale bunches out of the crate. Right. So they get washed. They get one dunk because the kale is always really clean. Gets one dunk, goes into a, um, a crate that's on a stand, like right next to the wash tank. Um, it's a, all my crates are like those black bulb crates. So they have holes in them. Um, so the kale gets dunked. It goes into this crate. It drains. Um, it goes onto the packing table, which is just right behind the wash sinks. Um, it sits there for, you know, until you get all the kale washed and then you take the kale out of those black crates that are draining. You give them like one shake to get any excess water off of them. And they go into a collapsible um, gray tote with a lid and they go into the walk-in. Okay. And kale harvesting, you know, could last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, like the whole process, depending on how many bunches we have to harvest. So it's a, pre- it's a pretty short trip from the field to the packing shed and, and into the cooler for that bunch of kale. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, and this is the thing that I think again and again, I mean, getting that product cold fast is, is just the real key. Do you have a, so you've got a walk-in cooler, are you use, using a cool bot system or do you have a, a regular commercial walk-in setup? No, I'm using a cool bot. Okay. And you like that? And I, I do. I love it. Um, my first walk-in, I built my first year and that's my cold room. And two years ago I built an addition onto the cold room. Um, and that is my like 55 to 60 degree room. And I don't, I don't have any separate cooling system in that addition. It's just, I have some holes cut in the wall where there's a door. Also you go into the, into the first room. That's the moderate room. Like I call it my tomato room. You go into that one and then you open a door to go into the cold room. So the, the cold room, it's a um, 10 by 10 walk-in. It cools the eight by eight walk-in that's attached onto it. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. So now you've, um, so you're doing, you said you're doing a lot of kale for the, for the natural food store in town. What other crops are you growing on a large scale? So, um, I sell there's there, we have a local, um, natural foods grocery store and I sell a little bit to them. They're, they're fairly inconsistent. Um, but, um, I sell a little bit to them. So I sell mostly kale, like the things that I planned on, growing and I planted excess quantities of these crops in order to have product to sell to natural grocers um, are kale, Swiss chard, summer squash and zucchini, cucumbers, and tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes and cherry tomatoes and scallions. How are those cherry tomatoes going for you? That's not an easy crop to make money on because of, of how intensive they are to harvest. Well, I sold a lot of them to natural grocers. So, for, so you, I felt you guys very got good money. <laughs> there you go. It's the good money. That's the key, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a lot of them so I, that you can get efficient at, at actually doing the work. Oh. Right. Yeah. Like the, next year, I'm going to grow a row of cherry tomatoes in my high tunnel so that I have them much earlier so that I can start selling them to natural grocers much earlier than what I did this year. Cause I just had them, all of my tomatoes were outside planted okay. this year. Okay. Now I know I saw some pictures on your Facebook page recently. You were, you were getting stuff into the, into your high tunnel for winter production. Um, is it just the one high tunnel? Um, right now, although, um, 
next week. Is it next week? No, it's in two weeks. The 13th, I'm putting up another high tunnel. That's great. That week, in a week. Yeah, in another week, I'm putting up another high tunnel and a, a very large high tunnel. Um, I, my first high tunnel I got um, in an RCS equip grant to put up. And, you know, this year um, the rules changed and they took out the um, square footage requirement. Like you could only have so many square feet of high tunnel previously. So they took, did you know about this? Yeah, I knew some about that, but yeah. maybe some of our listeners uh, don't. So this, and this is the not. NRCS cost share program where, where That's you can right. get funding. They'll basically split the cost of a high tunnel with you, right? Right. That's right. And if you're certified organic, they pay $4 and 51 cents a square foot for a high tunnel. And that's enough for me to hire somebody to put it up for me, wow. which I am doing. How nice is so that? Buying the high tunnel and hiring somebody to put it up for me. So the rules changed this year. So there no longer is a restriction on a certain number of square footage that they would only pay up to that square footage. Um, so when I reapplied um, this year, I applied for one very, very, very large high tunnel and I'm splitting it up and I'm putting up two high tunnels, but it doesn't matter. It's all about square footage. Um, so because I love, because I, I love they, specifics, Liz, when you say very, very, very large, yeah. how, how large? Very, very, very large. Um, so what I applied for was a 30 by 300 foot high tunnel and I am putting up this like in a week, um, I'm putting up a 34 by 198. And then next year I'll put up a 30 by a hundred. Great. All right. That's going to be a lot of fun in the winter time. Yes. That's why I'm doing it. So our market has no competition for winter production, none. And, um, I've even considered like taking a month off in the middle of the summer, honestly. <laughs> I, I, um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, there are so many, yeah, there's so many producers in the middle of the summer and um, none in the winter. And, I mean, there's a few in the winter, but they're not growing anything um, of like major volume. And so that's the whole reason that I'm putting up uh, additional high tunnels is so that I can have more winter production. Now, how cold does it get in, in, and if I'm right, Columbia is in relatively Southern Missouri, right? No, it's actually central. central. It's right on I-70. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, we're zone five. It, it gets cold. Oh. Um, we had three or four days last year where it didn't get above negative 10. Oh, um, that's, it's not like, that's respectable. It's not like where you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as cold as you where you are. <laughs> we don't get as much snow as where you are. Um, but it does get cold here. Our, our, our coldest months are, are January and February. And are, when you're doing the winter production in those tunnels, then are you using the, that the low cover hoop system, like the, like what, what Elliot Coleman talks about in his books or what, what, uh, what are you doing to give that additional protection to the plants? Yeah, I'm doing um, wire hoops and then over wire hoops. Um, I've tried multiple things. I'll do like a PVC hoop um, with a second covering. Um, I tried last year and I don't know. I don't think I, I didn't like it. Um, I, I ran cables from end to end in the high tunnel and I got one big, huge, sheet of row cover to like cover the whole thing with um, small hoops over each individual bed, but then one big sheet over the whole high tunnel. Right. Um, I tried that last year and you know, maybe I'm not, maybe I'd, I just don't understand it, right? Or it, it is impossible to move that big, huge sheet of row cover by yourself. And I am by myself in the winter. I don't have anybody here. And I did not like it at all. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go back to, I, I think I'm going to go back to um, just doing wire hoops with one love, one layer of row cover and then a, a bigger hoop over the top of maybe two beds um, with a, another sheet of row cover. Kind of so a, a, a layering I, effect with that yeah, layering. Yeah, I like it. And, uh, and so you mentioned employees. I mean, so you said in the wintertime, you don't have any help, but during the summer, you, you must have a fair number of people around on the farm. Um, this year I, um, I had two full-time employees from April through, um, 
the end of August. Um, and then I had two full-time interns. Um, the interns start um, the 1st of April and the internship goes through the end of October. So I still have two interns. And uh, I have a, a fabulous young man that worked for me actually when I was at Superior um, that last year wanted to come and, and work during his, he's in college. So for like a month and a half over the summer, he worked for me two days a week and he did that again this summer. And he was here for about two months this year, you know, on any given day, sort of full time it's there's five of us. And are you, you know, your, your interns and employees, I mean, um, the interns living on the farm? No, I rent a house just up the road. Um, from me, it's on my road, but just up the road, I, um, rent a house and they live in that house. Okay. And then are you still the person who's responsible for most of the tractor work and, and, uh, you know, all all of that, the kind of those higher level things, or are you, are you trying to get other people to be doing that as part of their, their learning process process? Um, I absolutely, um, train my interns on, um, on one of the tractors, um, on the, the 801 Ford, that's the, the tractor we use to haul things around on the farm. I train them on that tractor. Um, but any tillage, any cultivating, I'm doing that or my neighbor JT. Um, you know, when he comes over and he wants to help, I put him on a tractor any chance I can get. Cause it means I don't have to be on the tractor. Um, and I don't want him out, you know, pulling weeds or, you know, doing whatever we, we might be doing that is more labor intensive. Right. Um, so, so, so as you're, as you're going through that process of, of, of managing the employees on a day-to-day basis, are, are they all working the same number of hours that you are in the day or how, how do you, how do you kind of mix up those management responsibilities and those, those higher level farmer responsibilities with the, the actual need to be out there picking kale with your employees? Well, when my interns start, And this year, one of my employees worked for me part-time last year. So he had a little bit of experience under his belt. And then one of my employees was new this year. And and my employees are gone now, so they're not here anymore. One of the one that worked for me last year, he actually started college. And then, and Jason, he's also gone. So I just have two interns now. I also have a woofer right now um, who, um, she actually, she came, she was here for a week. She said she loved it. It was, this is like her fourth farm, I think that she, fifth farm, I guess, that she's now been on and she asked if she could stay on as an intern like through Christmas and I was like sure absolutely you bet um so I officially right today I have three interns but all summer I've had two interns um but it's no they do not work nearly as many hours as I do (laughs) um you know if there are like cultivating type things that need to happen. I usually do that at the end of the day after, after people have left or, you know, maybe they're, um, gathering eggs, washing eggs, cleaning tools, cleaning out crates like that. Maybe then that would be when I would go and, and hop on the G and do some cultivating. Um, but it's very, very, very important to me that for the first few months, um, I work side by side with my interns and wh- whoever is here on the farm. We do everything together. If we're harvesting onions, I'm right there harvesting onions with them. If we're weeding a carrot bed, then that's what I'm doing with them. Um, so my day starts well before their day and it ends usually well after they've left the farm. Um, I would say usually by September, my interns have a pretty good grasp of the way I want things done. I mean, there's still things that are new, like they've never harvested broccoli before. They never harvested cauliflower before, but generally the way the farm runs, they know my general standards for quality. Um, So by this time of the year, I am starting to divide up into teams and like have two people go and do something two other people go and do something else. Um, And maybe I go with one of those teams, but we're not all together doing the same thing together. Um, But that, that dividing up into sort of going different directions that usually doesn't happen until right around September ish. Um, I, I just, yeah, I don't think there's any, any substitute for that, that, that elbow to elbow leadership that working right beside your crew and making things happen. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I, she didn't tell me my woofer Elise, um, but in the first week that she was here, she told Sarah, one of my interns that 
on none of the farms that she had been on did the farm owner actually work with her doing whatever it was that she was doing until she got here. Um, and she was, she was like, wow. I, I mean, she's told Sarah that she was just amazed um, because none of the farms that she had been on over the last four months that she's been woofing, um, none of the farms, farm owners did that. Wow. And I would, um, I would think that with that, with the woofing program, the, the, which is, Correct me if I'm wrong. It's the Willing Workers on Organic Farms, right? Yep, that's right. They have they actually changed the acronym name. I don't know what it is now, but it it used to be that. So that's still what I call it because that's just what I remember it as. Okay, but um, but I would think that though that those would be exactly the kinds of farms where you would have the farmer out uh, out in the field working with the employees. Yeah, you would think so. <laughs> she said that none of the farms that she had been on were that they did that. They would they'd take her, they'd show her something, and then they'd leave and go off and do something else for two or three hours. Wow, wow. So, yeah, I, yeah. I just think it's a, it is a really important leadership function to be there with your crew, uh, doing the same things that your crew is doing and showing them how well it can be done, how fast it can be done, um, what your standards are. And I think it opens up, especially with interns, it opens up so many more opportunities for, for the education as you go as well. Hey, you know, these are, these are ladybug eggs. These are, you know, this is what we're seeing. This is why we're doing this this way that you don't get if you're just sending people off to do the work. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Liz, I know that you've, you've also recently added, well, I don't know if, if, if he's a helper yet, but um, hopefully someday will be uh, to your family. <laughs> right. So you're farming now with a, with an almost two year old. Yes. Um, Sylvia, her name is Sylvia. And um, she is a very eager helper. <laughs> um on the weekends when she's here, she um, does the chores with me. She wants to be outside doing whatever I'm doing. She's an excellent egg collector already. Um, she crawls in underneath the um, nesting boxes and gets the eggs that the chickens have decided to lay on the floor. Um, she, she goes uh, to town with Katie every day. So she's not here on the farm during the week. Um, she is here on the weekends. Um, so... But yeah, she, um, she, I, it seems like she loves, loves farm life. She always wants to help me and be with me whenever, um, whenever she's home. How has having kids changed your, your work patterns on the, on the farm or you're thinking about the farm? Um, you know, I, I try, I, I, I would say I try really hard and I have done much better this year having more help, um, on the farm. I, I don't work as late in the evenings. Um, I used to use the evenings for my, um, office work time to get caught up on emails and billing and paying bill, you know, whatever I used to use the nights for that. Um, and I, I don't do that so much anymore because, um, I'm hanging out with Katie and with Sylvia. Um, I do some of it after she goes to bed. Um, but in the evenings I'm here in the house and I'm just with them. Yeah, I, I, it would be, it would be very different. And I honestly don't know that I, it would work super well for me if she was on the farm and if Katie were, was on the farm. Um, Cause when they're here, I want to be with them. And if I'm with them, then I'm not farming. So, so it, it's worked really well actually. But like I said, um, you know, Katie's not on the farm every day and she's more than happy to be the farmer's wife and not be the farmer. Um, so for, uh, for us, it works, it works really well that way. I think it's really important that, that, uh, you know, to allow partnerships to take their, to take their natural form, you know, that it doesn't, it doesn't have to fit into some preconceived idea of, you know, oh, you know, one happy family, everybody working on the farm and everybody participating in everything. You know, there's a lot of different ways to shape that, uh, shape that vision. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm for better or worse, I'm a control freak and I don't know how well, I don't know how well it would work for the both of us to be on the farm farming every day. Um, cause I, I want things to be done the way I want them to be done. And 
yeah, I don't know how well it would work if Katie was on the farm. <laughs> she's a she's an incredible helper, and she she is more than happy to do things exactly the way that I ask her or show her how to do things because she is more than happy to say, I'm not the one making the decision. I'll do it the way you want me to do it, um, but I'm not the one that's responsible. Um, so for Katie and I, it works really well. Um, now I, I'm I would be thrilled if if Sylvia wants to help on the farm in a more, you know, like helping type capacity when she gets older, um, you know, I'd be thrilled. Um, but I don't know, it might not be what she wants to do. It's great. I think it's a great perspective. So uh, as we're, as we're kind of coming to the end of our time here, uh, we haven't talked, we've talked a lot about things that have gone well in your world. And I'd, I'd be interested in hearing about, uh, about one of your biggest challenges on your farm? Oh, um, hmm. Like on a daily basis over the last five years, um, the biggest challenge is, um, for me is, is being a good boss and having a good relationship with, um, the people that are here working on the farm. Um, and, and being able to create that level of, of respect that's necessary. And that, that line of, you know, I can be your friend, but I'm also the boss and this is also my farm and I need you to do things a certain way because it's my farm. I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge on a daily basis. Um, you know, the weather is always a challenge, but like, I can't do anything about the weather. So I have learned to just sort of ignore that (laughs) challenge. (laughs) I mean, Chris, between, between an hour ago and, oh, I don't know what time, seven o'clock last night, we got over six inches of rain. Um, so, you know, it rained a hell of a lot. (laughs) The, um, there's a low water crossing that you have to go over to get to my house and I might be able to get out now, but an hour ago I could not get out and I have CSA deliveries today, this afternoon. I was supposed to be in Jeff city, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't leave. Um, so I called all my members that pick up in Jeff city and they were like, Oh my God, Liz, stay home. (laughs) Um, and so I'm, I'm taking the CSA shares tomorrow. Um, uh, so I, I've just learned to, I don't freak out about the weather anymore um, because I can't do anything to change it. My very, so in my first year when I put up a high tunnel, um, I put up a high tunnel in the fall of 2010 with an NRCS equip grant. And in February of 2011, we had one of the biggest snowstorms that we've ever had. Um, I got 18 inches of snow and it collapsed. Um, that was a pretty hard lesson to learn. Um, and it was, it was very demoralizing, I think. Um, but you know, as soon as the snow was gone, I was out there and I had some friends come out and help and we took the thing down and put up a new one and I had stuff planting in it by May. Wow. That was like one of the biggest, like disaster type events, I guess you could call it that's ever happened. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and there's really not a lot else that you can do in that situation, is there? I mean, other than to, other than to just start over again. Yeah, just start over. I, I was, I literally was on my front porch. I had put on all my snow gear and I was going outside to go and start moving snow um, off the eye tunnel and I watched it collapse. Oh no. I was. Oh yeah. Oh, that oh, just yeah. makes my belly hurt when you say that. I'm, I know. I'm, I'm cringing oh, here. Um, yeah, I know. It was terrible, Chris, but it was, I mean, it was terrible, but I learned a lesson. You know, I will never ever sleep through the night if it's a big snowstorm. Like I will be out there in the middle of the night, making sure that the snow is not collecting <laughs> on the roof and or the sides of the high tunnel ever again. Um, well, and I think that's you one know, of those things about being a farmer, right? That, that you don't really, you don't necessarily learn uh, if you don't grow up on the farm, that there are those times when you, you have to be there. It's not, it's not optional. You know, that yeah. when, when, when running, when running a temporary heater in your greenhouse overnight is going to save the tomato crop, 
you have to be there to turn that on. When you when you've got snow in the high t- on the high tunnel, you've got to be there to get it off. I mean, you can't. Yeah. It's not showing up. Just isn't. It's it isn't optional. No, you better learn that your life is going to be on this farm, and you're really lucky if you get to leave for a weekend, or you know, heaven forbid, a week. It, you're really lucky if you're in a position to be able to leave. Have you taken a vacation um, in the last five years, Liz? <laughs> um, I go to visit um, my friends, Tom and Rebecca, that have Fair Share Farm north of Kansas City. It's about two hours, two and a half hours from here um, at Solstice every year. And I go for a weekend. Um, it works fine because my interns are here. It's a good time of the year to be gone. <laughs> um, and I have, I go to Moses um, and I'm usually gone for about a week when I go up to Moses and I stay with my friends at two onion farm. Um, and I'm usually gone for a week. Um, and I am just very lucky that I have JT who lives nearby and I always have a friend that comes and stays at the house. Um, but that's it. Get one of those in before too long goes by. Okay, Liz. Real vacation. <laughs> Get in a vacation. Vacation. Visi- a real visit- vacation. Visiting farmers and visiting uh, and going to conferences is not real vacation. You do have to pull one of those off sooner or later. Well, then that means that you have to come and stay here. Because <laughs> I need somebody that's more than just a friend, you know, that can stay here and make sure the house doesn't burn down. I need somebody that knows how to fall. All right. See, now I've got, now I've got my vacation cabin. what to look for. <laughs> now I've got my vacation yeah, cabin exactly. in Missouri. So, okay. Okay. So. I need somebody that knows more about a farm. Okay. Okay. Well, I, 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 I know that you know, I owe you a visit. So, uh. You, I, 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 we're going to make that happen one of these days. Oh, that would be great. Hey, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about real seriously this year, and I want to make it happen next year. Um, I don't, I would not say that I feel confident that I am no longer a beginning farmer and I'm moving into the, um, you know, realm of experienced farmerhood. Um, not quite yet. And I, I am determined to next season take a week and go to a farm that's, you know, similar to mine, CSA farm, market farm, maybe some wholesale accounts, um, a farm that's really nailing it. Like it's been doing it for a long time, longer than me and just seems to really be hitting on all cylinder and I want to go and learn like the things that I'm not doing that would make my farming operation better. Um, but I need to know what farm to go to. Yeah. You know, I would, um, I mean, my, I mean, two of my favorites are Harmony Valley farm in, in Wisconsin and, and TP produce in Southern Wisconsin. Uh, and talk about people that are just consistently producing successful results and have been doing it for a very long time, uh, both quite a bit larger than your operation. Um, yeah. you know, and, and I think it is, it is one of the challenges, uh, with being a, you know, a seven acre farm is you're, you know, you're, you're too big to do it all yourself and you're too small to not do it all yourself. You know, so, right. um, it means that a lot of those places have, have developed really different systems, but I do think it's so important to be out there, um, seeing other farms and hearing about other farms. That's part of what I'm hoping that, that the farmer to farmer podcast is going to provide is kind of a, I mean, it's not a visual, but, uh, you know, sort of an audio tour of, of farmers and what farmers are thinking about, because I think it's, it's so important and it's so easy to let that slide by on the farm because you are just busy and the farm will demand uh, everything that you're going to give to it. So, you know, if you don't make the time to actually go out and get that education and do that real professional development, it's not going to happen of its own accord. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's why I really am determined to make it happen next year, but I I need to, I need to find the farm that, that I think that I could learn a lot from and, um, and make that connection and, and just decide on which farm I want to go to. Well, see, so what you're going to do is you're going to subscribe to the farmer to farmer podcast and you can listen <laughs> to hear, uh, to conversations with farmers and you can pick out the one that you want to go see. Eh, 
okay. I think that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> All right. Well, Liz, I've really enjoyed hearing about your farm. Uh, this has been a great interview and a great chance to actually sit down and, and have a have a longer conversation with you. And Likewise. Liz, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, expertise, and experience. Thanks for having me, Chris. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 142 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Happy Hollow. That's H A P P Y H O L L O W. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by CoolBot, allowing you to build an affordable walk-in cooler powered by a window air conditioning unit. Save $20 on your CoolBot when you visit farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash CoolBot. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your email inbox by signing up for my newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, if you enjoy the show, please head over to iTunes, leave us a review or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show directly by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. And finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. And I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.